A Canadian psychologist helped states like Tennessee justify laws against gender affirming care. These kids in general are not better off transitioning. James Cantor is a gay, self described liberal whose work supports many U.S. lawmakers, including some opposed to homosexuality. An abomination. I don't pretend that, you know, their religious goals are the same as my scientific goals. Few Canadians know that he's playing a key role in the medical and political controversy raging in the U.S. Jonathan Montpetit from our investigative unit breaks down Cantor's impact and the reasons he gives for what he does. Between angry messages in the streets and hardline conservatives in power, now in session, trans youth in America are at the center of a political firestorm. You will not be erased. As a trans minor, that like it's really disheartening to see. I have 77, 16 names. Nearly 80 laws passed this year alone. I move to roll to the hill of the minutes. An objection. Roll to the hill. Next minute, Miss Court. And in the courtroom battles over these laws a controversial Canadian psychologist. In the video recorded deposition of Dr. James Cantor, these kids in general are not better off transitioning gender. In this strip mall off the Chapman Highway on the outskirts of Knoxville, Tennessee, is South Press Cafe, where owner Jocelyn Fish runs a queer-friendly space in a state that's passed more anti-LGBTQ laws than anywhere else in the country. It's about legislating trans people out of existing and public spaces. It's about criminalizing it, and it's also about inciting fear in us. One of the latest measures, a ban on what's called gender-affirming care, treatments that studies suggest can help trans youth with depression and suicidal thoughts. This Knoxville family, the Bats, can now no longer get medical gender care for their trans child, Zane, anywhere in the state. It's like if another child my age needed life-saving health care and it was denied to them, people would lose their minds. And get health care as a minor. At the Zane's parents asked that we conceal their child's identity given the threats that trans people face in Tennessee. Chrissy and Daniel say before the ban went into effect, they were having long conversations with doctors and therapists about Zane's gender care, a process, they say, that made Zane much happier. We just want to live our lives and, and make the best decisions for our kids that we possibly can based on professional guidance. Gender-affirming care for trans youth can include a range of treatments, from new pronouns to puberty blockers, and for some older teens, hormone therapy. It's an approach to treating gender dysphoria that has the backing of every major medical association in the U.S. But in Tennessee, Republican lawmakers expressed deep mistrust of the medical consensus around gender care. I had always believed in conservative values the way I was brought up. Uh, and House Representative Sabi Kumar, himself a retired surgeon, was one of the sponsors of the bill that banned gender-affirming care. From my understanding, major American Medical Associations, the American Academy of Pediatrics, American College of Physicians, American Medical Association, they all say... American Society of Endocrinology. They all say the same thing, you know, that the gender care is safe, uh, it's effective for treating um, gender dysphoria. You're a physician. Why, why not trust the, the professional bodies of, 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 of your profession? Because of the ideological contamination of these societies. Why is this such an important issue for Tennessee Republicans? Conservative values are based on God, family, country, and the values that America was founded on. Homosexuality in the biblical scripture is an abomination. And our constituents in majority believe that. So because we are following those biblical and godly values, that is reflected in the legislation that we pass. But when it comes to defending these anti-trans laws in court, conservative states call upon a different kind of authority. Expert witnesses who question mainstream medical opinion about what's best for trans youth. One of those experts is Toronto psychologist James Cantor, who has testified in a wide range of transgender cases, from pronouns to school sports to gender care. The problem besetting youth today isn't just kids with gender issues. It's the entire generation of youth who have been raised on social media. 
but a lot of people, what the situation looks like, are using trans status to escape their insecurities about their, you know, pending uh, adulthood. I don't advocate for any particular uh, policy. Really what these people need is the therapy for dealing with the situation that they're in. Cantor says he is just a scientist willing to share his take on the research with whoever asks. In court, he cites contested studies that claim the increase in teens identifying as trans is the product of social contagion, vulnerable teen girls who are trying to fit in. Is the implication of what you're saying that somebody says to you, regardless of what age they may be, I'm a trans woman, I'm a trans man, your response is skepticism? It depends on the context. If I'm being uh, asked within a therapeutic situation with a client, I am pretty much by definition, you know, being asked a person uh, by a person who is unhappy with the position that they're in, and my job is to coach, to push them a little bit, to help them, you know, feel comfortable questioning themselves and approaching things in new and different ways that they hadn't before. So it is sometimes uncomfortable for a person. That's the role of psychotherapy. But some have questioned whether Cantor has the relevant experience to determine what's best for trans teens. And you personally have never treated any child or adolescent for gender dysphoria, right? Correct. Okay. Earlier in his career, Cantor worked at Toronto Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, CAMH, alongside psychologists like Kenneth Zucker, who has argued that children should be encouraged to accept their sex at birth. In the U.S.? In the light of this data, I must agree with a noted researcher from Toronto, Dr. Ken Zucker. Conservative lobby groups pushing anti-trans legislation are often citing those former CAMH psychologists. Such prominent figures as Stephen Levine, Kenneth Zucker, Paul McHugh, and James Cantor, among others. These doctors are giants in the field. When these groups started coming to me a year and a half ago to ask if I you know, would share what I know uh, uh, in court settings, that was how they introduced themselves to me. Dr. Cantor, we probably disagree on every issue under the planet, uh, under the sun, except this one. Well, to me, is okay, so we will work together on this one. That's what a liberal is supposed to do. The bans on gender care are forcing families with trans children to make difficult decisions. In Tennessee, some have already packed up and left. Those who can't leave must now travel hours out of state for treatment. What would you say to these, to these people who um, are really feeling the effects of a law that you have kind of gone to court and helped defend? First, I hesitate to say exactly that I defend a law so much as I defend the science. What a government does with the science is what a government does with the science, and I always want any government, whether the U.S., Europe, Canada, to make any decision uh, uh, based on the best uh, science available. You're still choosing a side, though, in a, in a court case. Uh, no, the side is choosing me. Uh, if my read of the science were different, then it would be the other side you that hired me You could say no, for, right? Uh, I mean, like, if, if, they came, if they came to you, say, Dr. Cantor, we would like you to testify. Because, but no, I, I, I'd rather not. Yeah, no, and uh, that was a tough question that I had to ask myself when they did start uh, asking. Ultimately, the decision I came to myself was that I'm a scientist. My job, I will give the science to whoever it is that asks. Once I came in, I just took it And over. so many are asking Cantor for his science that he told us he has more than doubled his income this year. What it boils down to is that we and other families who are trying to support our kids are following the advice of actual medical professionals. We have talked to trans people, we have, you know, we are a part of the community and we have been very conservative in our approach to doing things. No one is going out and saying, you know what, I want to be trans, I'm going to go get surgery and it just happening. There are no parents that say, you know what, I wish my kid was trans. Let's go get surgery. That's not happening. It's just not um, anywhere. Um, and so people like James Cantor and, and, you know, others like him are pushing a, um, a narrative and claiming that things are happening that just aren't. Zane's parents have chosen to stay in Tennessee and lobby against the ban. 
their family-run bakery raises money for local LGBTQ causes. Staying will mean frequent travel out of state for Zane's gender care and dealing with a hostile political climate on a daily basis. But Zane is undaunted. For me, the choice to stay and fight. I believe that anyone should be able to do anything they want as long as it's not hurting anyone. Zane's younger brother, Charlie. I'm glad that I can help and defend people who I love, especially. It's in spaces like South Press Cafe where it can feel a little less lonely to be trans in Tennessee. Jonathan, watching that, it makes me wonder if experts like James Cantor are playing a similar role here. Well, the governments of New Brunswick and Saskatchewan both recently introduced measures that would force teens to get parental consent before changing their pronouns at school. Now, these measures are being challenged before the courts by civil rights groups who say they are unconstitutional. New Brunswick hasn't yet indicated who they intend to call as a witness in its case. The government of Saskatchewan, though, did call upon an American psychologist who is popular in conservative circles to help defend its policy at an injunction hearing last month. Now, of course, Saskatchewan lost that decision, but Premier Scott Moe has indicated he intends to use the notwithstanding clause to make sure his policy goes into effect. All right, Jonathan Montpetit, thank you. You're welcome. Next, older Canadians are most at risk this flu and COVID season, but which vaccines are best to get? We explain next. This is the season to take care of your breathing. I am at a very high risk. You've got COVID, the flu, and more to contend with. I know it's a bit of a labyrinth, if you will. And older Canadians are especially vulnerable. So we asked Lauren Pelly to break down what seniors need to know about the various vaccines on offer. As the temperature dips and more respiratory viruses circulate, medical experts say seniors remain among those most at risk of dire outcomes. During last year's flu season, for example, roughly half of all outbreaks were in long-term care homes. And when it comes to COVID-19, nine in 10 deaths so far have been among Canadians aged 60 and up. So here's what older Canadians need to know. We'll just have you in here. Physicians say vaccines can be a key way for seniors to protect themselves from serious illness. Seniors tend to be more vulnerable in cold and flu season because their immune systems are not as strong as younger people. There are four key vaccines available for seniors this fall for COVID, influenza, bacterial pneumonia, and respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. Let's start with COVID. Those shots have been updated to better match circulating virus strains. <laughs> Health Canada has already approved mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, and a third option from Novavax is expected too. A second key vaccine, the annual flu shot. Those doses are now rolling out as well, plus some provinces offer enhanced versions for high-risk seniors, which offer even better protection. Number three, there are also multiple approved shots to protect against bacterial pneumonia. The condition happens when certain bacteria get into the lungs. The most common is pneumococcal pneumonia caused by streptococcus bacteria. Canadian data suggests the death rate is typically up to 7% and even higher among the elderly. Number four on the list is new this year, Canada's first vaccine for RSV. It was approved in August for adults 60 and up to combat a virus that can lead to serious lung infections. And while RSV hospital admissions among seniors happen less often than for other diseases like COVID or flu, recent U.S. data showed they're typically linked to more severe disease and ICU stays. It's only approved for the elderly. This pharmacist says with so many vaccine options to protect seniors this fall, some Canadians might be confused about what's available. So if you have questions regarding coverage on different vaccines, especially the ones for respiratory illness, it would be very important for you to have a dialogue with your pharmacist. Your local pharmacist can typically guide you through this. I know it's a bit of a labyrinth, if you will. The challenge now for many seniors could be affording some of these shots. COVID shots are free for all Canadians, and basic flu shots are too, though in some areas you might have to pay for enhanced options. 
When it comes to pneumonia shots, eligibility for a free vaccine depends on the province and the product. And for the brand new RSV vaccine, experts expect most seniors will have to pay out of pocket. <sighs> Bradford, Ontario resident Walter Armstrong already has asthma and wants to avoid catching RSV. I am at a very high risk if I was to get RSV. If any complication with that would, you know, be the equivalent of a death sentence. But he was shocked to learn he'd be shouldering the cost of more than $200 for the new vaccine. Tough for Armstrong on a tight monthly budget. I won't have it this month, I won't have it next month, next year, never. So his question now, why the government, you know, is not covering this at $256 when we know if a person is hospitalized for up to five weeks and on a ventilator, the cost is tens of thousands of dollars. I just wanted to check where you're at with things. This geriatrician hopes the RSV shot is eventually covered, but in the meantime, he worries those cost barriers could discourage some of Canada's most vulnerable. A lot of people right now can't make ends meet, and so how are they going to even undergo this vaccination? Medical experts say the bottom line for seniors is get all four vaccines, if you can, to give yourself the best shot at staying healthy. So Lauren, there's a lot here to think about, right? We're talking four vaccines for seniors potentially all at the same time. Can they take them all at the same time? Can you help us navigate this? Absolutely. Well, some of these vaccines are safe to get in the same appointment, the COVID shot and the flu shot, for example. But some of this can be case by case. So, you know, it depends on when you last had COVID or your last vaccine. So I really want to say to people, talk to your doctor, mm -hmm. talk to a pharmacist about what works for you. Uh, it's also worth asking when you get one of these shots, especially the new COVID shot, make sure you know what you're getting. Ask your pharmacist, whoever's giving it to you, exactly which one you're getting so you know that it is the newest one if that's what you're looking for. Adrian. All right, Lauren Pelly, as always, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, Peaches the cat is making waves on TikTok. He meows a bit and, and protests a little bit, but he's great. Putting in the work to shed a few pounds, his viral workout routine is next in our moment. Well, believe it or not, this Edmonton cat is swimming his way to TikTok stardom. Peaches, of course, the cat is diabetic. His owner was looking for a way to help him shed some weight, and that's when they both hit the pool. So a TikTok account was made, videos were posted, and the next thing you know, Peaches was kitty paddling his way to viral fame. His workout routine is our moment. Peach is a 13-year-old domestic short hair. He was diagnosed with diabetes. Good job. And the vet told us that there was a chance his diabetes could go into remission if we were able to get his weight down. You ready? What we do is we pick him up from the bench and take him to the farthest point in the pool and then let him swim towards the bench. He meows a bit and, and protests a little bit, but he's great. Yeah. We also have a hydro treadmill and he's actually doing really, really well in there. He lost uh, a whole kilo, gained a little bit of it back, but he looks a lot thinner. I created an account for Peach and started posting his videos from the pool. I think our most viewed video has 10.5 million views and he was on the Jumbotron at the Oilers game last Saturday. Come on. He's just been a joy at the pool. Peach is definitely a character. Come on, go there. He's yeah. quite vocal in how much he doesn't like the pool. Yeah, it's been really good. It's hilarious, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we hear you, Peaches. We know you. We know we can hear you don't like it that much. But apparently he's lost so much weight, he's starting to need less insulin. So that's great. And can I just say, at a time when the world feels so hard, thank you, Peaches. We need a little brain scrubbing. From all of us at The National, thanks for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.